presentar al invitado ya. Adelante. Ok. Bueno, pues, eh, colegas, muchísimas gracias por presentarse al seminario del día de hoy del de proyecto de COVID-19 que tiene la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México en aspecto de modelación de la epidemia. Es un placer eh, contar hoy con la presencia de un paisano, además muy distinguido, joven investigador, que es profesor de epidemiología matemática en el Departamento de Population Health Sciences en la Escuela de Salud Pública de Georgia State University. Es además, eh, eh, of, eh, tiene también una afiliación externa, eh, con, eh, es research, Senior Research Fellow en la División de International Epidemiology y Population Studies del Fogart International Center, National Institute, Institute of Health. Además, antes de llegar a Georgia State, estuvo en la Escuela de eh, Evolución Humana y Cambio Social en la Arizona State University. Es miembro de los comités editoriales de BMC Medicine, BMC Infectious Diseases, Epidemics, Mathematical Biosciences and Engineering, Infectious Disease Modeling, Scientific Reports, Plus One. Eh, tiene varios proyectos de National Science Foundation, trabajando precisamente en aspectos de epidemiología. Eh, Gerardo se ha distinguido siempre por su alta productividad en asuntos de epidemiología, de modelación matemática, estimación estadística, y particularmente en esta pandemia ha tenido trabajos muy distinguidos, eh, mucho del trabajo que se tiene acerca de la distribución de periodos de incubación, de los automáticos, por ejemplo, en aquellas épocas del Diamond Princess, el crucero que ustedes recordarán, eh, Gerardo hizo, eh, fue coautor de los estudios, altamente citado artículo, entonces es realmente un placer tener a una de las personas que ha contribuido de manera importante para eh, el, el análisis y estudio de esta enfermedad. Entonces, eh, sin más preámbulo, eh, vamos a empezar el seminario, simplemente como señalaba este, eh, Isaac, eh, si pueden apagar eh, sus micrófonos, eh, su cámara, para que la transmisión se pueda ejecutar de manera más eh, segura. Y eh, vamos a proceder. Eh, la plática va a ser en inglés. Estamos esperando que se unan colegas de Estados Unidos. Y sin más, sin más, simplemente, Gerardo, por favor, la pantalla y la audiencia es tuya. Muchísimas gracias por venir con nosotros. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, Isaac, for organizing this uh, event. I'm very happy to be here and give this presentation. Uh, I will focus on some of the methodologies that we have been working on over the last uh, few years um, on you know, trying to improve epidemic forecasting and now applying those methodologies to forecasting the COVID-19 pandemic in particular ensemble uh, approaches. So here's the outline for my presentation. As a way of introduction, I will first focus on um, you know, the characteristics of epidemic growth, uh, the idea of, of uh, modeling uh, epidemic growth beyond exponential trajectories. And then I will connect that with some more recent work on using uh, multi-scale models to investigate the, the dynamics and, and, and forecasting multi-model or uh, sub-epidemics uh, as, as the aggregation of uh, epidemics as aggregation of multiple sub-epidemics. And then I will present uh, how we use these sub-epidemic models and how we connect them to the actual epidemic trajectory data and the applications uh, to COVID-19, specifically uh, to the US and some examples beyond the, the United States. And finally, uh, some more statistical methods that we have been working on for a multimodal and ensemble a modeling. So let me get started. Um, this is the slide about the Kermark McKendrick model, 1927. I think most of you are familiar with the simple SIR model. I basically just want to for, uh, emphasize the assumptions, the main assumptions behind this model, the fact that the population is well connected, well mixed, it's homogeneous, every single individual looks the same behaves the same. Um, the probability that the virus travels uh, across any pair of nodes is the same. And as a consequence, we, we expect to observe exponential growth uh, in a completely susceptible population when R0 is greater than one. So this type of model only accepts in the simplest, at least in the simplest form, accepts exponential growth trajectories. Uh, it's a rigid, 
uh, outcome of the model that uh, may not be the, uh, um, the best in all of these situations. Uh, this type of model can be expanded to include, uh, to incorporate other uh, features, epidemiological features, different behavior in, uh, across different groups. Um, here's an example of actually for Ebola, where the authors incorporated the role of funerals in the transmission dynamics. Um, but again, uh, the assumption of homogeneous mixing uh, restricts, in a way, the type of epidemic growth scaling that, you, that, that we expect uh, to observe during, at least during the early growth dynamics. And that can be a, a limitation. So as a consequence, if we use this type of models in the absence of additional information, we expect that the epidemic will continue to grow exponentially fast as long as R0 is greater than one, right? Which may not be the case all the time because epidemics are also regulated by contact networks, by behavior changes, and, and, and uh, multiple other factors that sometimes are not observed that can influence the early growth and dynamics. Here's an example of three epidemics that have the same size, but different epidemic growth scaling. They don't grow exponentially fast. They have different epidemic growth scaling. And that uh, specific type of um, growth scaling could be related to the mode of transmission, right? Some pathogens are spread uh, through the air, through close contact. Some others are only spread through close contact or intimate contact like, like Ebola. Um, and we can expect uh, in those situations, we can expect that the epidemic will tend to grow so by exponentially fast, it's lower than exponential. I will show you some examples. Reactive behavior changes also can quickly uh, influence the early growth dynamics. As I said, contact networks, clustering, and other individual level heterogeneities that um, may not be observed could be playing also a, a role. Here is, I think, the canonical example of an epidemic that grows sub exponentially fast, the HIV epidemic. As, as we know, the, the HIV uh, virus is spread through intimate contact, uh, through sexual intercourse, injecting drug use, and so that limits, in a way, the, how quickly the virus can spread in the population, the contact network in which the virus is moving through. In the United States, the HIV AIDS epidemic followed a cubic, uh, a cubic polynomial. And indeed, the, this cubic polynomial holds even when the data is stratified by geographic regions or by ethnic groups, which makes a very interesting feature. Another example is the Ebola epidemic in West Africa of, of 2014, 2016. And when we look at the data at the subnational level, you can see that the epidemics grew relatively fast during the first few weeks. And this, this figure shows uh, the epidemics in log scale on the y-axis. You can see that quickly the epidemic saturated and it slowed down. Uh, consistent with uh, something that grows more uh, slowly than exponential growth. And at the same time, we can see that the epidemics didn't, were not triggered see, almost you know, simultaneously, which happens uh, uh, in many other situations, but actually uh, it looks like a wave of disease that is moving uh, or traveling through, through the population of, the, in this case, Guinea. Okay. So we are seeing asynchronous local sub-exponential epidemics. Here's uh, the, what we think is the, the reconstructed Ebola transmission tree of the early dynamics and back in the town of Ekedu in Guinea, where we can see that the virus was moving through caretakers, family members, relatives, and healthcare, um, healthcare personnel that was taking care of the patients in, in clinics. So really the virus was not moving uh, in the population at large through the air, you know, which is the case of other pathogens, respiratory pathogens, including the influenza and COVID-19. And so the next uh, step is to, once we recognize that epidemics may follow different epidemic growth scaling, 
how do we measure that epidemic growth the scaling? The generalized growth model allows us to do that quantification. This is a simple ex uh, uh, elaboration of the Malthus model, as you can see here, adding the P parameter, uh, what we call growth scaling or deceleration of growth parameter, uh, can help us quantify not only the growth rate, but also the, uh, epi the growth scaling. If P equals one, right, we go back to the Malthus equation, the exponential growth model. But if P is less than one, then the epidemic is growing sub-exponentially fast. And it, it is of interest to measure uh, the uncertainty on, on that parameter as well, uh, which is influenced by the amount of data that we have related to the early growth of the epidemics. So we have measured this parameter P across a number of outbreaks um, using data that was available, um, publicly available back in, the, in 2016. And as you can see, as you can see the P parameter really varies a lot. There's a lot of variability. There's not a clear pattern. Um, you know, some of the respiratory pathogens tend to be closer to one. For Ebola, we have a lot of variability. Most of the parameter values of, of P for Ebola are less than one, consistent with a, a pathogen that is spread, um, that is not spread through the air. Um, and so what is the consequence of having an epidemic that is growing sort of exponentially fast? Uh, we know that when the epidemic is growing exponentially fast, mean, that means that the growth rate is basically constant during the early period. And as a result, R0 is well-defined according to the mathematical theory of epidemics. And the reproduction number is basically equals to E to the R times the generation time, the, the length of the generation time when the, the, the variance of the generation time is assumed to be fixed. So there is no variance. Or uh, well, the variance is zero, actually. But if P is less than one, then we are in a completely different uh, landscape, terrain here, because uh, to, for starters, R0 is not well defined. Uh, but, uh, if we follow the concept of R0 uh, from the theory of epidemics, but actually the reproduction number is, is actually a dynamic quantity and it's actually changing over time. And it's actually declining over time asymptotically towards one and you know we prove that this quantity here uh, is asymptotically approaching one which is the epidemic threshold of one so if the epidemic is not growing exponentially fast we have a reproduction number is actually changing all the time it is actually not growing but it's declining and it's approaching uh, the epidemic threshold of one now, the, these ideas can be applied to particular specific outbreaks. Here is an example uh, on the 2014-16 the Ebola epidemic in Western area urban, where you can see on the left how the model is fitted to an increasing number of data points. Each point is a week in terms of number of cases reported in a given week. You can see that the model fits well the, the data and the parameter P is much less than one, definitely not an exponentially growing epidemic. It's more like uh, almost linear growth. P is around 0.5. And on the right, you see the, the distribution, empirical distribution of the reproduction number on average is 1.3, has some substantial uncertainty. And, in, and you can see how the reproduction number tends to decline as we, as we have more and more data, which is consistent with the, the theory, right? As the epidemic continues in this fashion, so exponentially growing, the reproduction number will tend to decline towards one. So what are the, some of the mechanisms that could lead to sub early sub-exponential growth? I gave you already some examples. Here's an example with a spatial model with a highly constrained contact network. Uh, the top panel shows a susceptible population. The red, uh, the red square is one individual. In the second panel, you can see that uh, each column corresponds to a household. So that individual interacts with another five individuals. And then there's another level of mixing. Uh, 
a group of households, households um, make up a community, okay? And the communities are overlapping with each other as well. So this individual in red then interacts with people in their own household, but also um, not necessarily with the same transmission rate uh, with other households in the same community. Okay. So this is an example of how that epidemic could, could uh, expand over these lattice. You see the first panel are the, what we see during the first 21 days in black are the infected individuals in the gray area are susceptibles. So basically we are seeing how the virus is spreading in the form of a traveling wave um, a outbreak and how quickly this epidemic is traveling can be regulated by the community size, right? You can have a situation where every single household belongs to, to the same community, spanning all the population in that situation, you can recover homogeneous mixing, right? So the, the more constrained the community size is, the, the a more spatial uh, signature in the spread that we will see. Here, um, here you are seeing the epidemic trajectories for this household community model. Uh, when the community size is 25, so each household belongs to 25 households. And you can see how the red curve, which is the average of uh, many stochastic realizations follows sub-exponential growth, right? Because it's growing with this curvature, it's in log scale. Um, and the, the black line is the corresponding exponentially growing epidemic that is not, not happening. And it's just, and just shown here as a reference. The reproduction number, sorry, the reproduction number on the right is, it starts at two, but then declines over time because of the sub-exponential property and approaches one. Point zero. Now we can now move beyond uh, the early growth to think about epidemics that are uh, composed by the aggregation of multiple subepidemics, right? So we can think of these epidemics made of subepidemics as the aggregation of multiple underlying mechanisms, right? We can have uh, pathogens that are spread in high risk groups. Let's think of the MSM population or injecting drug use populations. And then from there, the virus can cascade transmission to lower and lower uh, risk groups, heterosexual populations, for instance. Or we can think of an epidemic that is happening in multiple geographic areas, that the, an epidemic that starts in geographic area A and then after a while, the epidemic is seeded to geographic area B, and you have a, the start of a new subepidemic in such a way that when we look at the aggregated trajectory, uh, we may be able to detect multiple peaks, multiple modes that hint at the presence, presence of multiple subepidemics. And of course, more recently, the idea of the emergence of new variants, right? The virus is mutating, and some of the mutations may be epidemiologically important, significant, uh, to the point that the reproduction number or some of the epidemiological properties may be changing over time. And as a result, we may see, uh, we may investigate the overall epidemic as the aggregation of multiple subepidemics according to the variants that are circulating in the population. Uh, here's another example. Here's an example, actual example for the Ebola epidemic in Congo in 2018, where you can see ups and downs, the fluctuations, how the virus was spreading across different uh, administrative regions of Congo. Many of these outbreaks are linked to prior um, violent events. Uh, that is the, the attacks to treatment centers. Uh, related to the response in, in Congo that were set to fire or they were, they were dis destroyed. And um, so this violence actually hampered, right, uh, which is well known, hampered the response and the, the possibility of containing the epidemic. It took substantial amount of time to, 
to mitigate this epidemic, even when you know there were weeks, the maximum number of cases that were reported in a given week were only 140 cases. Uh, so related to this is the fact that when we have an epidemic, when an epidemic is evolving, right, we have a limited amount of data, right? In most of the situations, we have time series of the number of new cases that are reported in a given region, or by you know maybe by age group with you know some stratification. Uh, however, we don't have often more detailed information that can tell us about the transmission process, right? Who is infecting whom? Ideally, we would like to have that detailed transmission tree that could readily tell us, you know, what groups are mostly affected, tell us something about the reproduction number, just by looking at the transmission tree, tell us about the frequency of super spreading events. So we often have these epidemic curves and many different transmission trees can give rise to the same epidemic curve, right? Um, so we have to deal with the fact that we have limited amount of, of information in an epidemic curve. Um, an example of this is of an transmission tree, a real transmission tree that was characterized back in 2003 during the SARS outbreak in Singapore, right? Most of the cases occurred in healthcare settings affecting patients and healthcare workers. When we look at the epidemic curve, which is on the bottom of the transmission tree, we see a first uh, outbreak or sub-epidemic that mostly affected a particular healthcare setting. Uh, and then there's a second peak or second mode, right? That is associated with transmission in another healthcare setting or healthcare settings, right? So it is only with the information about the transmission tree that we can relate these two modes of transmission, right? This outbreak is starting in a transmission setting, in a healthcare setting, and then the virus jump through the movement of healthcare workers and patients to other healthcare settings, and then there was amplification. And so this epidemic resulted fr from the aggregation of multiple um, outbreaks, right? That at some point where the first one was independent of the second one, and, and shape, right? Gave the form, gave the shape of this uh, outbreak. So how can we characterize these multiple subepidemics in a rather empirical way without you know, having to deal with the fact that some subepidemics may be influenced by some mechanism, some other subepidemics may be influenced by different mechanisms. So it, it, to for start with, we can use uh, empirical ways of doing this. Uh, and we have been, you know, uh, successfully modeling these uh, sub-epidemics or single epidemics using uh, the logistic growth model. We call it generalized logistic growth model because we add that P parameter, right, related to the sub-exponential, the, the early sub-exponential growth dynamics. And uh, so we have now three parameters. Parameter K is the epidemic size, right? So we can estimate three parameters for a, a given sub-epidemic. And at the same time, we can accommodate different uh, early epidemic growth scaling by having this structure with a P parameter. Right? Now, in order to characterize an epidemic wave, so an epidemic that is made of multiple subepidemics, we need a system of equations. Uh, this is the first subepidemic sub wave model that we uh, published in, in BMC Medicine back in 2019, where you can see that is basically a system of equations, differential equations. C of i corresponds to the community number of cases for subepidemic i. R is the growth rate. P is the scaling over parameter, as, as you know. And um, there is this indicator variable a, uh, uppercase a sub i minus one, that that basically allows us to connect multiple subepidemics. So a sub i of t is a function of time equals one when the current epidemic, uh, the number of cases, the cumulative number of cases exceeds a given threshold, which is a parameter in the model uh, called C sub THR. Whenever that cumulative number of cases for the current subepidemic that is uh, progressing in, in the population exceeds that threshold, 
The next sub epidemic takes off. So that would be C of two. You can see in the, in the figure, the first sub epidemic is in red. The multiple red curves correspond to the uncertainty. I'll tell you in a, in a minute about uh, how we quantify the uncertainty. And then the blue curves correspond to the second sub epidemic. And then the green one the, is just uh, emerging, as you said, as you see there, uh, is the third sub epidemic. And the gray, um, the gray curves correspond to the aggregation of the three sub epidemics. And the, the black circles are the actual data. Okay. Hey, hey Gerardo, uh, can yes. I ask a question? Yes, please. How how does the the how does this dynamic ever go down? I mean, it's a logistic, it's a logistic equation which uh, typically just goes up to a, a certain value and stays there. Oh, yes. When you're looking at the oh, okay, that's a great question to clarify. C of t is the cumulative, but if you get the, you take the, the derivative of that, that gives you a bell shaped curve. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So what you're seeing here in this graph is incidence. Uh, you're right. Cumulative incidence corresponds to CFT. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So now the parameter K sub i corresponds to the size of the subepidemic i. Okay. That's something that we need to model. So let's go to the next slide. K sub i, the size of the subepidemic i equals this function. Basically, K naught is the size of the first subepidemic, okay? And then the size of the subsequent subepidemics will decline exponentially fast according to this function. Q, the parameter Q regulates how quickly the next subepidemic will be uh, declining, right? The greater Q is, that's modeling interventions, more is, is, uh, intense uh, interventions or changes in behavior that mitigate transmission. And so you have, Epidemics, so epidemics that will tend to decline over time, depending on the value of Q. If Q equals zero, the size re remains the same. Okay. So it's, this is a nice function, obviously, because it has a closed form solution. And if you want to know the size of the epidemic wave, the total epidemic wave, uh, you just need to know the size of the first subepidemic, how many subepidemics you have, which is N and Q that regulates interventions. So in this model, we have uh, three parameters if we only have one subepidemic, right? So that's the simplest model. But if we have more than three, more than one subepidemic, we just need five parameters. So basically it's RP, K, K naught, and then the threshold CTHR and parameter Q. So regardless of the number of subepidemics that you need, you only need five parameters. And this is very important because then we can uh, use the model and try to fit it to the, to the data and be able to estimate the parameters with some reasonable amount of uncertainty, right? Because we don't have one to have a hundred parameters because it would be impossible to identify all those parameters. Um, so here are some of the representative uh, subepidemic wave profiles that you can obtain with this simple model. The first one is like a traveling wave. The second one is um, a, an epidemic wave with a very broad peak. And then if, you, if your Q is greater than zero, that means there are interventions. You can model an epidemic with a long tail. Um, now, if the subepidemics are weakly overlapping, so they are not too close to each other, you can actually see the, the subepidemic modes, right? And the fourth panel. Now, uh, to fit the model to the data, we use a simple approach. Basically, uh, use maximum likelihood or least squares to fit the model to the data for the first time and estimate these five parameters. And once you do that, you can add error structure to that fit. Let's say Poisson error structure or something more elaborate like uh, over a uh, negative binomial if you want to model over dispersion. And then to each of these realizations, you refit the parameters. And then if you do this 200 times or 300 times with the bootstrapping approach, 
then you will end up with an empirical distribution of each of the parameters from which you can get the point estimate and you can get the uncertainty, right? The variance of that parameter. And it's actually also nice because you actually have all of these epidemic curves um, for, uh, for each realization, right? And you can use that envelope in the uncertainty to do a projection, to do a forecast. Um, so you have, you have in your hands all of the, uh, the information that you need to characterize uncertainty for the current state, but also to project it into the future. Now, to assess how well the, the models are performing in these forecasts, there are a number of metrics. Uh, the community is converging to us uh, to a set of metrics that include, you know, the mean absolute error and the mean squared error. These function, these measures basically only rely on the mean, on the mean solution of the best fit. But if you want to incorporate uncertainty, then you can look at the coverage of the 95% prediction interval, right? Which measures how many of the data points are within your 95 prediction uh, prediction interval. Something more sophisticated is the mean interval score, which is related or it's an um, a elaboration right, of the prediction interval because now you are not only measuring how many data points are within the prediction interval, but also whether they are too far away from the prediction interval um, or whether the prediction interval may be too wide, right? Because we will have a prediction interval that is too wide, it's not useful for public health authorities, right? So you need to be penalized. So the lower the mean interval score, the better the performance, okay? Here is an example of the fit of the model to the one done data. In this example, we only needed one sub-epidemic uh, to, to fit the data, as you can see. On the top panels, you are seeing the estimates of the parameters, R, P, and K. In the bottom panel, you are seeing how the model fitted the early data points prior to the vertical line, before the vertical line. And then the forecast is on the right of the vertical line. You can see in this example how well, you know, the uncertainty is well characterized and many of the future data points are within this uh, prediction interval, which is nice to have. Now, here is the example with the SARS outbreak in Singapore that I showed you that with that transmission tree um, of the outbreak that affected healthcare settings. It is nice to see how the subepidemic web model characterizes those two subepidemics in red and, 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 and blue. Okay, so it's inferring these two peaks. So there is some information there to say something about the, the structure of the epidemic wave. Um, here's another example of the fit to the epidemic in Madagascar in, 2000, in 2017. The outcome here is four subepidemics that are strongly overlapping, as you can see here in, in red, blue, uh, green, and magenta, right? Now, we can use this information, right, to generate the forecasts. So the calibration occurs prior to the vertical line. The forecasts are the next four weeks after the vertical line, okay? And this is a, a forecast for the plague outbreak that I show you. You can see how the model infers, right, the presence of more than one subepidemic, right? Even, even if it is not obvious, it's readily obvious to the eye, uh, the model is inferring that there are two or even three subepidemics in some instances. And by doing that, we are getting a, an improved forecast, right? Because if we were modeling this with a single subepidemic, the outcome will tend to see uh, that the epidemic will start to decline right away, right after the, the last calibration data point. Here are some of the performance metrics where you can see that the subepidemic web model is performing much better than simpler models that are made of one single subepidemic, such as the, the Richards model. And so in 2019, we quickly started to use this machinery to forecast the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, starting with the 
outbreaks that were emerging from, from China. And then later on, we started to forecast uh, the pandemic in the United States. And we have uh, many of the forecasts archived on the website. Um, here is an example of the early forecasts for the United States. You can see that on the top, at the very early on, the model was predicting a single sub-epidemic. There was no more information um, to detect that actually this was going to get into a level enough. It is until the third panel that you see that the model infers that there's more than one sub-epidemic. And you see multiple co colors how the model was, was inferring the presence of three or four uh, sub-epidemics. And by doing that, it was able to get this level enough, right, the plateau, uh, or a, slowing, a slower decline, if you want, the uh, phase of the epidemic. Uh, the sub-epidemic world model, you know, perform much better than uh, simpler, simpler models. And we're in the process of assessing how well this model not only overperform, uh, perform better than the Chip Richard model, but also other models, including those models that have been using by the CDC forecasting uh, effort. Here's an example for Spain, where you can see the model, the calibration is again, prior to the vertical line, in first two sub-epidemics, right? But it also uh, infers a third sub-epidemic in green that is just starting to grow, right? And it turns out that um, there was a third sub-epidemic or a third mode, if you want, in the, in the Spanish epidemic where you can see here how it starts to emerge again, uh, the, the third sub-epidemic. And this is the fit of the sub-epidemic web model to the entire Spanish epidemic curve. It's, it's uh, um, a nice fit. The, the parameters are, are well identified, as you can see in the top panels. The uncertainty is, is reasonable as well. Now, more recently, we have been uh, expanding this work to accommodate more complex, um, a little more complex um, sub-epidemic waves, right? Because the prior model doesn't allow you to have a resurgence period, right? After a period of stability, if you have resurgence, you will tend to have a sub-epidemic that overshoots the first sub-epidemic, right? So in order to do that, then we need to add a little bit more flexibility to the model. And now what we do is estimate a RP, the RP parameters, so assume that the R and the P are consistent across all the sub-epidemics, for instance, but then you need to estimate K, the, the size of the sub-epidemics for each sub-epidemic separately, right? So the number of model parameters is two plus N, where N is the number of sub-epidemics times, no, sorry, just two plus N. Okay, so this two is actually because we have parameter R and P, which are fixed across all the sub-epidemics. Here is an example with simulated data. So the data on the left, the black circles are simulated uh, using the same model. And then the model is used to infer that, that uh, shape and infers indeed the first sub-epidemic in, in, in red and then the Resurgence period in blue is also uh, uh, detected there. And so we can use this to study the, the resurgence period of the, the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States in the summer. Uh, you can see that at the beginning, you know, this is June 18, the model was not yet detecting the resurgence, right? But then after, one day later, it starts to pick up something. So that's, that indicates that there's a sub-epidemic there already. And then this is June 20th, June 21st. You see the data points are within the prediction interval. The mean is a little yeah, higher than the actual data points. But overall, you know, the uncertainty of the prediction interval uh, is capturing the coverage of this. The prediction interval is, is, is good. And this is the same picture, but here I'm showing you in red and blue the two sub-epidemics. And then a few more forecasts that we have been conducting uh, almost every week. 
This is uh, the forecast that we conducted in uh, December 1st and the actual data points later on. Uh, so this is in real time. Uh, the, the red circles were placed later and, and you can see that the, the model captured all of them. There's quite a bit of uncertainty here. There's a lot of over dispersion here. Look at the numbers. Um, and, and this is during the period of the declining phase uh, in, the, in the winter. This is for January 1st. And then the most recent periods, this is February 3rd. This is uh, March 1st. This is March 7th, right? So you can see how the tail is actually another sub-epidemic. This is the model is detecting basically two sub-epidemics. The first mode, which is very large here, and then the second is part of the, the tail. And this is, I think, one of the most recent forecasts. And so the model has been doing uh, a nice job there. Uh, we'll see how, how it does in the next uh, couple of weeks, right? Because we know that the variants, the new variants are taking over, but at the same time, the vaccination rollout uh, is going pretty well, right? So there's a race there. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how uh, the model detects the resurgence and how large that resurgence is. Well, there's already a resurgence that looks more like a, a plateau, but then the question is whether this resurgence actually gonna overshoot, right? That uh, level enough. And here's the same picture, but showing the two sub-epidemics. And as a way of summary, uh, just to say that you know the idea, the paradigm of using sub epidemics to understand the broader scale epidemic trajectories uh, has shown a lot of promise. There's a lot of more work that needs to be done. Um, we have been looking at other uh, ways of connecting the model to the data, such as characterizing first the heterogeneity in the data using function, functional data analysis, right? Because some areas. Uh, in the United States, uh, shown uh, different uh, dynamics than others, right? Remember the first, we had the outbreaks in New York City in the northeastern part in California, and then later we had uh, outbreaks in the south and then in the mountain uh, area, right? Central part. And so if we can characterize that heterogeneity first before we apply the subepidemic wave model to each of those clusters, and now after that, we can join the clusters into a national forecast. There's, uh, it looks like that's improving uh, uh, the performance in general. Uh, how, many, how many more minutes I have, Isaac? Isaac? Um, I would think uh, yes. uh, five, 10 more minutes. So go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So I'm almost there. Um, so now the switching a little bit from you know, mean field ensemble ideas of multi-scale models to more statistical ways of doing ensembles, what we call multi-model ensembles. So if we have multiple models, they don't have to be consistent with each other. You can have some models, uh, you know, some of it could be with metapopulations, with edge structure, some others could be uh, stochastic, uh, agent-based models, et cetera, et cetera. How do you join them together in an ensemble in, in the best way to generate the ensemble, right? Uh, with an improved performance metric relative to the individual models. And so in that direction, we have been doing work uh, with Dr. Ruyan Luo, uh, my colleague at your state, and we compared two different uh, uh, schemes of assembling uh, models. The first one in the top, basically we have the models and we take the average of them based on the weights W sub I um, that are defined based on how well the model is feeding the data. So a model that fits very well the data tends to get higher uh, weight than the others. And so the ensemble is the, the ensemble average based on those weights. In the top, and sorry, in the bottom panel, the idea is that for each data point, 
right? We select at random one of the models, one of, one of the I models, right? Based on that weight. So for each, um, for each data point, right? Defining time, the model is selected with a probability, right? That depends basically on the weights, okay? So it's a different way of joining the models here. And what we found is that by doing that, by actually doing that randomization, the random selection of the models for each data point, right? So for one data point, you may have uh, model one, for another data point, we have model two, and then model one, one, two, so forth. By doing that randomly, actually we improved the performance of the models. Here's an example. So the top uh, panel is ensemble one, the bottom panel is ensemble two. This is um, showing an example of the performance of the uh, generalized logistic growth model in, for the epidemic outbreak in Anhui, China. You can see that ensemble two tends to have better coverage of the 95% confidence interval. It covers more data points in general, not only for COVID-19, but we actually uh, applied this to many other out uh, outbreaks from Zika, COVID-19, flu, Ebola, and similar data as well. And so what we are seeing is that, you know, by using that ensemble too, where the, the models are selected at random based on the weights, you get better coverage, as you can see, right? In particular, better mesh metrics uh, that incorporate uncertainty of the models and lower mean interval score. As here is another example with, you know, same story. Uh, but that tends to be the case, not only for these two outbreaks, but for many others. Uh, and that's something that we reported recently in BNC medical research methodology. Uh, and well, that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, collaborators. My PhD students, actually Kimberly and Rusa recently um, joined the group of Nina Fairferman at University of Tennessee. And I have two uh, um, other students. I'm Natarik, uh, my current PhD student, um, who, who, um, who is about to finish probably in one year or so. And Yisha Lee also contributed uh, to the efforts. She's in Korea now, uh, working uh, in a public health uh, center. And a number of collaborators that have you know, uh, contributed in, in different ways to, to this work, uh, from Ruyan Lu and their state, Rich Rottenberg, uh, Kenji Mizumoto, Kyoto University, Cecil Biguta, Fogarty, Mac Hyman, Tulane University, Maria Kiskowski and South Alabama, and Ping Jan at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Thank you very much. Any questions? Very happy to try. Thank you much, Gerardo, for this very, 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 very interesting talk. I, uh... I really, personally, I really enjoyed it. Uh, colleagues, uh, do, do you have any questions? Questions can be either be, can either be in, either in English or Spanish. So please just unmute your microphones and go ahead. Or just uh, write something on the chat and I can, I can, I can read it. I have a question. Go ahead, Philip. So uh, it seems to me like you uh, have the machinery, at least, uh, that could that could detect new variants, and I'm wondering. Uh, I guess the, the it would be a different approach because uh, you would have to um, allow you would have to allow R to be variable. Here, you're, it, it seems to me you're you're fixing R. You said you're fixing R and P. Uh, uh, I think you would need to al allow. Um, R to be variable, and then look for uh, statistically significant changes in either R or K, which are two well-known components of fitness. That it's the R K selection, um, at, and so if you if you look for significant changes in, in one of those two parameters, 
uh, that could be indicative of uh, a novel strain. That with, well, at least we, well, with a different fitness. So uh, I, 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 I saw that you, you mentioned the uh, different strains at some point. Okay, uh, sorry, I lost the connection for a few seconds, but I'm back. <laughs> And I think I got most of the, uh, your question. Um, that's, that's great. That's a great co uh, uh, question comment. Um, so yes, so let me go back to that slide related to, to the additional model we have trained here and super epidemic wave model, right? In this version, R and P are fixed, right? Yep. But you can make it even more flexible to have R and, and not, well, R or P or both change over during different uh, sub epidemics, right? Okay, and right, right, right. You have to pay the price because then you need more information to yeah. need them. And maybe it depends on the data. It may, you may have enough information, you may not have enough information. And yes, I love the idea that you raised of monitoring, right? How the growth rate could be right. changed time to assess whether oh it looks like we may have some new variant or something different right it could be a new variant or it could be a change in behavior actually um, actually i'm not i'm not sure that p uh would qualify as a component of fitness i i think i think you're right that it's, it it may have to do more with um network structure than uh reproductive fitness but the, i mean the, the, the real key parameters are are r and k and they're, they're classic parameters in you know, population genetics and evolution and biology. Uh, and and they, they, uh, they're two different, uh, um, it's R versus K selection, right? And it would be really, really interesting to look at those parameters um, mm -hmm. look for differences in those parameters uh, in the different. Um, yes, I love the idea. I, um... Yeah, you're bringing population genetics, how this can be connected to that. That's great. I would love to, if you have any references on that, uh, to get motivated, I would love to hear uh, on those. Uh, that would be wonderful. Sure. But yes, yeah. monitoring those parameters and um, seeing how they, they abide to certain theories of population you know, genetics. Right. Population. That would be interesting, right? Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. I think uh, Jorge, I, I think that Fernando had an, an, a question. Okay, I think. Fernando, go ahead. Yes. And then, and then uh, you, Jorge, right? Okay. I have a question also. <laughs> Hola, ¿qué tal? Um, hey, okay, so let's go in. First, Fernando, then Nancy, then Jorge, then uh, I, I, can, I would like to also ask. Uh, go, go ahead, Fernando, please. Uh, well, my question is very simple. I was just wondering if these models. Uh, can incorporate underreported cases because, for example, in, Me in Mexico, the quality of the data is not very good, and we have actually that problem of underreporting. So, mm. uh, how does these models can do that? Yeah, that's a million million dollar question, right? Not only for these models, but for any model, uh, underreporting on um, it, it's an issue, and it's a most. Uh, it's an issue, particularly when it's changing over time, right? Here in these models, we, we are saying, okay, one case represents something with some level of underreporting and some level of testing. And, um, and that's reflected in the data that is being observed. But if that underreporting is changing over time, then that can have a substantial uh, effect on your results. And not only for these models, but, you know, for any type of model. Um, so I think in order to accommodate on the reporting, we will need to do additional, perhaps additional work to reconstruct something that is closer to reality before we apply these models to the, to the signals, right? Great. Yeah. Any, any, great. Anyone has any, any clues on how to do that for the data from Mexico. Maybe Jorge, you have deal. I think you have done some work with the data from Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a comment. Yes, I, have, um, I think I will wait for the next question yeah. and yeah. then I'll go. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Nancy, uh, you have a question as well. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Hi, Gerardo. Thanks. 
thank you. I, I have a question about the time delay between the two maximum or the maximum values of the so epidemics. So is there any relationship between this time delay or any way to, to, to measure this, uh, well, this interval from each okay. maximum? Right, the time delay between between sub epidemics, right? Like yeah, the, the maximum of the sub epidemics, yeah. Okay, so peak to peak, what is the distance yeah. time from one peak to the next? Yeah, how um, are the, those related? Yeah. Okay, that yeah, they must be related to the threshold of at which the next sub epidemic uh, takes off. Uh, there will be a relationship. I don't, I don't have an, a, a closed form solution for that. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't thought about it. Uh, the only thing that uh, that I, I have thought about is, you know, if if the next sub epidemic takes off when a great fraction of the cases for the first sub epidemic has already occurred, particularly after the peak the modes will tend to show up in the aggregated epidemic, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, they are overlapping too much. Mm -hmm. I would say they are strongly overlapping. And then it looks more like an, a broader epidemic, right? But you don't see by eye from the aggregated trajectory, the, the peaks, the multiple peaks are characterized in multiple sub epidemics. Uh, so uh -huh. yes, there will be a relationship. Uh, I don't know what that is exactly, but um, okay. that's an interesting question. Because, well, I was thinking about this, uh, what you mentioned about the new variants. So in that case, uh, well, if a new variant appears, how would be the, the time delay from, the, mm. from one epidemic to the next? If, well, to compare the, to the other possible scenarios that you mentioned, that might be other circumstances, but okay, mm -hmm. um, thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. Yes, okay. Well, the time delay in that situation you're mentioning with the new variant is uh, likely related to you know, the incubation time and to the, the reproduction number of the new variant, perhaps in a mechanistic model with two variants. Uh, yeah, that would be something that could be investigated. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Jorge, go ahead. Yes. It's a, a very interesting talk, and I uh, wanted to ask the following. In Mexico, and I guess in other parts of the world, uh, much of the social dynamics at the population level is driven by events, civic, religious, kind of those kind of things. In Mexico in particular, the country, as you know, we have a calendar, uh, we were studying this, uh, and. Uh, we have a calendar that we've known all our lives, but when you look at it, it's very interesting. You have, let's start with uh, last year when the epidemic started to create problems. We have Holy Week, then we have Children's mm -hmm. Day, then you have First mm -hmm. of May, then you have May 3rd, the day of the Albañiles, uh, then we have May, th May 10th, then that stopped. Mm -hmm. And we have some uh, governmental uh, indications of ending mitigations and so forth, but they don't have as much impact as the other. Then after June, July, August, you come to uh, Independence Day, that is also a, a long weekend. And many of these things are, are long, long weekends because you have these points, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have you have the uh, after that you have uh, the Dia de la Raza. Then you have uh, the the holiday of the Day of the Dead that starts from. If it is a weekend, is even worse. You have three, four, even five days, depending on the year. Then in Mexico we have this commercial thing that was the Black Friday. The equivalent in Mexico is the Buen Fin. Then after that you have the Guadalupe Virgin Day that is these pilgrimages, matches that you know. Then you have Christmas, which is posadas and all the stuff. And then you end with the wise men and then you start again. And what we was not, have noticed uh, looking at the data in Mexico, even when soup reporting, 
is that all these data present increases in positivity, in hospitalization, in morbid mortality. And if you took a model, um, as uh, some version of the Kemar McKendrick model, you can estimate the variable effective contact rate. And you indeed see that even these dates, you have flare ups of the rate. Right, like pulses of uh, amplification, right? It's like, like you have pulse right. and then for between yeah, periods. In these periods, and you can see that in the data. It depends on how long is the, is the uh, super spreading event. You can have the, the the jump in all these indicators immediately afterwards, or even within the period, because uh, because of the disease, the, the nature of the disease. Then we are using this historical evidence, because mm -hmm. even and you can even predict things because this year in Mexico, a federal election, so you know that on six June is mm -hmm. going to be news, and before campaigns that start someday soon or even started probably i don't know but then then you can you can have and you can I, my bet or many people's bet actually is these are the super spreading events that are going to continue to move the epidemic in the countries that have very very uh, mild control mitigation strategies and also these events are my, my that's intuition is were more likely the New mutants, if they are exist in Mexico, will uh, will will spread faster and will be the initiation of all the, many of these events. The problem is, uh, it sounds reasonable, but uh, the problem is where will it start, right? But that is another question. And my yeah, and looking at your and we have this model that uh, we have the historical uh, evolution of the of the epidemic last year. We have fitted our model. We have what you have to do. To fit the model, but for the predictions, instead of making a forward prediction with some statistical technique, we take the basic the effective reproductive uh, rate that we computed last year. We have the yes. history uh -huh. and say the, the jumps in the effective contact rate will be more or less the same, but it's not going to be the same scenario because we have a depletion of the number of susceptibles. And our RT last year was most of the year around one. Now we've been like two months, like around 0.8. So it's, it's not going to have the same effect, but they will be super spreading events. And I was wondering, looking at your this, uh, multiple epidemics, if that technique could be used to improve these scenarios. Because we, now we, we only do, we, we cut our, our estimation of parameters and, and uh, model fitting to February. And then looking at the changes on the contact rate possible changes because of this Holy Week and these things, we increase or not uh, mm -hmm. the, the reproductive number and the contact rate. But probably with these methods, you can you can have a more systematic way. And the question, I mean, long, long, long example, but the question is, have you, have you looked, worked or know about mm -hmm. work that have, are using these key calendar dates as indicators of super spreading for the prediction of the, of, 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 uh, of uh, of epidemics? Mm. I don't know. This is a question. That's... Great. Um, not that I, on top of my head. No, no, no. That's okay. interesting. So you're saying we have this his historical data with, you know, these properties. Now we can use it, right, to predict. Because uh, they are periodic, right? Indeed. They repeat every year. And you, you can, in advance, you know if it's going to be a long weekend or only an isolated day. Or you can, you can, you can do many things because you know what is going to happen because our calendar days, right? Right. And if right. you assume that the changes in the contact rate will be more or less the same, you have a way of forec not, not forecasting to making pre projections. Yes. So I would, you know, I would take that information as additional information to what we have, right? Mm -hmm. That will provide additional information that could tell us that we could say, based on this, uh, I expect new sub-epidemics with different growth rates, right? right? And different sizes around these periods of time. And then you roughly define where you expect the sub-epidemics to occur or the changes in the sub-epidemics, right? Yeah. And then- the magnitude, the, right? The magnitude, the, the growth rate. Uh -huh. right. I, would, I would look at the relative changes, right? You said reproduction number? Right. No, no, the, at, uh, 
we, we measure the, um, the, the effective, the, the instantaneous reproductive number and, and uh, the contact rate, because then the, the number of susceptibles is very hard. In Mexico, we cannot do it. We don't do testing. We don't have anything. But that is a parameter that is really the problem. How many susceptibles are still available for infection, given the history of the epidemic and the, the, way, the, the, the fact that we have temporal immunity. And now, what Phil was saying, the new variants, right? Well, right. that was broadly what uh, I was thinking. So that's, about. yeah, that you're saying there is more information that could be used, and that most likely will help you improve. Right. For, you for don't have to rely only on the statistical method. It's, uh, you have to, right? But, right. but there, we have a history of a year in a country like Mexico, where these right. religious and civic days are really places where the people go out with the family or with whatever things. These are super spreading events by definition. And we can't predict when they are going to occur and how long they right. are going, going to be. So you, I would use that to do, as you said, right? Not, not only short term, but you know, try to project longer term based on that information. Uh, the, the, how the super epidemic will chip up the summer, for instance, the okay. summer in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I, I will send you the reprint. So you, you, Please. you, are, okay. you can- That would be great. Maybe that it, we, we can, can collaborate on. Okay. Right, right. thank exactly. you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Gerardo, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jorge. You. There is a question in the chat. <clears throat> Uh, from uh, Eric Avila in Spanish, so I'll read in Spanish. Dice, eh, dice Eric, eh, o pregunta Eric, ¿podemos incorporar en estos N eh, subepidemic wave models vacunas, okay. estructura de edades, etcétera, etcétera? Yes, uh, for in this particular structure, uh, en este tipo de modelo que, que presenté, uh -huh. no está listo para hacerlo, pero sí se podría utilizar en el contexto del clásico SIR, ¿no? Modelo SIR. Entonces, en vez de tener el General Diagnostic Growth Model como una subepidemia, ahora un SIR, ¿sí? Corresponde a una, como una metapoblación corresponde a una subepidemia. La diferencia con un metapopulation model como el que conocemos en, eh, en la literatura es que en este, sub, en este contexto, la siguiente subepidemia empieza a crecer una vez que el número acumulativo de casos llega a cierto threshold. La, da, la, esa es la diferencia fundamental entre el clásico metapopulation model, donde tienen migración, rates, eh, que son eh, parámetros con tiempo, eh, versus este tipo de, de framework. Y sí, sí he estado pensándole, echándole una pensada de cómo se puede incorporar. Y una vez que tienes el SIR, pues sí se podría agregar más detalle, ¿no? Como vacunación, como tú dices tú, o, o el, más refinación en términos de los grupos de, de transmisión, grupos de etarios, etc. Sí. Eh, no, no tengo referencia específicamente, pero lo que te digo es algo que es básicamente lo que presenté, pero ahora el, este parámetro, déjame regresar a la, a la el slide donde... Oh, ¿qué más por acá? Este parámetro C sub TH, THR, CTHR, que es un común threshold, se define. Entonces, una vez que el número de casos en tu SIR alcanza cierto valor, el cumulativo, eso triggers, eh, inicia el, el crecimiento del siguiente epidemia, lo cual modelarás con otro SIR con otro grupo, grupo, ¿no? Entonces hay que decidir ahí ya los R0, cómo están relacionados entre ellos, los tamaños de la población, si los tamaños van a ser definidos más o menos constante, la N, por ejemplo. Eh, pero sí, he estado, he estado echando una pensada de, de repente y podría, podría haber algo ahí. Eh, con gusto, con gusto por estar en contacto con, con Eric uh, sobre eso. Fantástico. Eh, si me envías a mí la información, se la puedo enviar a, a, a Eric. Eso, muchas gracias. A, eh, creo que Gerardo eh, tiene una reunión y se va a ir. 
Yo, yo tenía preguntas, eh, solo voy a hacer una porque ya nos hemos pasado un poquito de tiempo, si me permites, Gerardo, es de carácter técnico. Y ya lo voy a comentar, si nosotros, de hecho, con mi, con mi grupo que estamos trabajando en cosas de epidemiología, también estamos trabajando en eh, un tipo de approach donde consideramos eh, un, el, el, un número infinito, de, un, un universo de, de infinito de posibles modelos para fitear datos, ¿okay? utilizando técnicas de redes neuronales para resolver ecuaciones diferenciales. Pero te, te quería hacer una pregunta de, los, de, de, de la última parte que explicaste, de los dos ensambles. Eh, me preguntaba si de alguna forma los pesos tienen en cuenta la complejidad del modelo que estás utilizando para fitar los datos. Porque claramente, si, como dices, que puedes utilizar modelos diferentes, incluso mecanismos, incluso mm. términos, eh, técnicas muy diferentes, cada modelo tiene una complejidad y de alguna forma se tiene que capturar en los pesos. ¿Eso lo hacéis? Se puede hacer. Eh, en este paper que publicamos, utilizamos el mean square error. Pero, ¿sabes que se podría utilizar el AIC? Claro. El AIC y, y, y ahí te, te incorpora información sobre el número de parámetros asociado con, con el modelo que estás utilizando, ¿verdad? Eso es sí, más o menos lo que tengo en mente. Sí, de alguna forma, porque si tú utilizas modelos con muchos parámetros, entonces el fit te va, te, te va a quedar mejor, pero tienes que penalizar porque tienes más parámetros y eso te va a incrementar la incertidumbre, incertidumbre asociada a ese modelo. ¿Okay? De tal forma como lo estés haciendo, de alguna forma estáis pensando los modelos de la misma forma. Bueno, teniendo en cuenta, por ejemplo, el likelihood, pero no tienes en cuenta sí. la, la complejidad del modelo. También una cosita, me sorprende un poquito porque que los dos ensambles te den resultados diferentes porque la intuición al principio dictaría que deberían ser equivalentes los dos ensambles. ¿Cómo lo hacéis? Oh, ¿no? Exacto, es, ese es un buen punto. De hecho, en el paper eh, mostramos que la varianza del segundo es mayor. La ah. varianza del ensamble eh, y damos la expresión. No, no, es, no es difícil. Te puedo mostrar la expresión okay de este que está no la, no la puse en la presentación pero eh, te la te la puedo presentar ahora mismo o, o, o si quieres me puedes enviar el paper y, uh, y, y, lo, y lo discutimos no te envío ¿Sí? Sí. Para no sí, 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 está en el te envió el paper y no. sí, la, la, la diferencia es la varianza tiene mayor varianza en el segundo ensamblaje que mm. en el primero y eso es lo que te permite como te ayuda a, a capturar más este punto ya, en la, eh, en ya, la ya, pero la, ya, pero creo que es intuitivo porque entonces la segunda tiene era tiempo de Poisson, ¿no? Tiempo, lo, lo, lo generas de forma Poisson en, la, la, en el tiempo, ¿verdad? Sí, le erro, le erro, es Poisson, es cierto. Uh -huh. Ah, ok, ya veo, ya veo. Eh, bueno, pues. Eh, eh, otra, otra pregunta rápido, rápido. Una, otra pregunta rápida, Philip, porque ya nos estamos pasando un poquito de, de tiempo. Adelante, Philip, por favor. I just had another thought about evolution and uh, the, the parameter P. And I wanted to get your thought on, on this idea. So, I, I, my, my, my thought is that if P should be inversely related to the, the strength of selection, because If you have a smaller p, then your your the, the strains the, the 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 contacts are well the the, the different uh, potential strains are in are in closer uh, contact with each other. Um, if that makes sense, if that makes sense, right? They're 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 more directly in, they're more in in direct, more mixing more mixing more interbreeding they're, 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 they're yeah. more in, direct, in direct contact with each other. So interesting. Okay. okay. Anyways, yeah. that, that's just a thought. <laughs> Something to yeah. No, I love to I love to reconnect with you, Philip, because then you have these ideas from population genetics that can help us refine this. this yeah, model. yeah, yeah. I think yeah. there might be a nice, a nice approach here to look at look for uh, a, a way to detect uh, novel strains and that sort of thing. That would be very cool. Yeah, and with, statistically and all that. Okay, I would love to. Yeah, maybe if you can send me a reference or two, Philip. Maybe sure. we can start from there and yeah, start a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and nice to see you too. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Yeah. So very good, uh, guys. Well, Gerardo, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. I think I really enjoyed it. Uh, so we thank you, okay, uh, for visiting us uh, virtually in Mexico City <laughs> uh, for giving this talk. Uh, and uh, colleagues, just to remind you that in two weeks we'll have a uh, the next seminar. It will be given by a uh, a colleague of, of us from Mexico City, Ivan Santa Maria Oleg. I don't have the information yet, but I'll send it soon. Okay. Once again, yeah. Gerardo, thank you very much. 
Thank you, guys. Uh, see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay.